All righty. Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar tonight. Um, my name is Lisa Carey, and I am one of the Family and Community Engagement Specialists. Our office seeks to create meaningful partnerships between you, the family, and all of the many community partners within our city in order to inspire, engage, and empower all families um, to support the initiatives of Chesapeake Public Schools. This year, we've been happy to announce that we've added four new members to our team. Um, listed here on the screen, we have Laura Lurf, April Darnell, Aisha Hughes, June Jones, and Anna Medina. They all come from a variety of different backgrounds, which will help support our Chesapeake family. Our office provides a variety of resources for families. This includes workshops and webinars to meet the needs of our families, a multimedia library of educational resources, and many educational Better Together series videos. Our effective networking skills help us collaborate with families and serve as advocates to support the needs of children and their families. It is our goal to ensure you receive the best possible resources to support yourself and your family. Last but not least, we want you to be an engaged parent in doing so, we provided a variety of opportunities for you as well as other stakeholders to volunteer in a variety of capacities. We host a variety of parenting workshops, special education workshops, community resources, English language resources, and social emotional learning resources, just to name a few. Upcoming for January 21st, we have our first annual Parent Literacy Summit which will be held at Oscar Smith Middle School on Saturday, January 21st from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. This uh, parent literacy is just for parents and it will provide you with a variety of literacy um, activities and workshops just for families and so that you can help educate yourself as well as your children on a variety of topics. On January 25th, we'll host another uh, exceptional learning webinar. This will be entitled Medicaid Waiver um, that webinar is at 6.30 p.m. Information was sent out on Peach Jar and registration is required. On February 11th, we'll host a teen summit at Hugo Owens Middle School. This is for teens and parents. A light breakfast will be served and lunch. This event is from 9 a.m. until 12 p.m. Information has also been sent out in Peach Jar and registration is not required, but we would like you to register so that we can have um, a number um, for participants, excuse me. And then on February 14th, we'll be hosting another Grand Families Workshop. This is for Grand Families and Caregivers. Um, this session will be entitled Healthy Hearts. It will be held at Camelot Elementary School at 10 a.m. And this is an in-person event. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Ms. Regina So um, for our There Are No IEPs in College. I hope that you all will get a wealth of knowledge and information from this workshop. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. So. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening. Uh, again, I am Regina Stowe actually one of four transition specialists in Chesapeake Public Schools. And as you can see in front of you, four of us, uh, we serve both middle and high schools. Uh, the schools in dark print are where our offices are located. So myself, Dr. Frankie Dampierre, Ms. Sharon Willis, and Ms. Christina Trinello. As a transition specialist, we assist our special needs students in their post-secondary planning, basically life beyond high school. For many of our students, this may be going straight to employment, joining the military, or going to college. Hence our topic this evening, there are no IEPs in college. We have three panelists tonight. We have Beth Callahan, who is the college-wide coordinator, Office of Educational Accessibility, Tidewater Community College. Elizabeth Jakabowski, she is the Educational Accessibility Counselor, Tidewater Community College as well, Chesapeake Campus. 
And we also have Dr. Beverly Boone Harris. She is the director of OASIS, which stands for the Office of Accessibility Services and International Students, Norfolk State University. Ladies, thank you for being our panelists tonight. And I believe we are going to begin with Ms. Callahan. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Again, I'm Beth Callahan and I'm with Tidewater Community College um, with our Educational Accessibility Office, so our Disability Services Office. So like the title of the presentation said, there are no IEPs in college, um, but we often have parents ask us, what do we do for college? And so what we do is we just call them accommodations. So we do give accommodations to students in college. It's just not the long 30 page IEP plan that is given to students in high school. Um, so what accommodations do in college is they provide access to the coursework, um, to any program of study, and also to campus activities like clubs or any events that we have. Um, they level the playing field for the student, um, and they're reasonable, but they do not modify curriculums. So students still need to meet technical standards, um, but we do provide accommodations to help them meet those. So some common types of accommodations, this is just a, a list, um, but there are really endless possibilities, but common types of accommodations that we do have are testing accommodations. We often do extra time on tests. Um, a lot of times we do try to do reduced distracted environment for testing. Um, we do access to notes when they're available. Um, we can record lectures, which is something you haven't been able to do in high school. So um, recording on your phone, or there are a lot of different um, free technologies and apps out there now for note taking. Um, a lot of assistive technology. Um, some colleges can provide um, different types of technology for students to check out and use in their classrooms. Um, there are attendance accommodation, uh, do preferential choice of seating. We can do large print tests and handouts, use of a calculator, um, use of spelling checker or spelling dictionary. And these are just a few of them. So one of the things that we do need at college is some kind of documentation. So students need to provide um, their disability service office with documentation of their disability. And it really, the documentation really depends on the type of disability it is. Um, a lot of times if it's medical or um, <laughs> It, medical is really a letter from the doctor telling us what the disability is, along with um, some weaknesses or some areas that you may be accommodated in. Learning disabilities, we like to see the psychoeducational testing um, when possible. Um, we don't have at TCC, we don't really have a time limit on it. So if it's from fifth grade, of course, we would like something newer, but we will look at it and discuss it with the, um, the student. Um, and the documentation is reviewed by the counselors and it's in conjunction with an interview for the student. So we use the, the documentation, but we also talk to the student about what their strengths and weaknesses, what type of accommodation they've used in the past. If they have their IEP, we'll review that with them and look over it with them. So it's not just documentation and that's it. We do do kind of a multi-level um, interview. It's very interactive process with the student to determine what kind of accommodations are needed. Um, we need to make sure that the student is eligible to receive services under um, Americans with Disability Act in Section 504. So there is a different law once students graduate from high school, they're no longer covered under IDEA. Um, they do go over to ADA in Section 504. And like I said before, the documentation is really a key part. We look at that in conjunction with talking to the student uh, to kind of determine what accommodations are reasonable and appropriate. Um, so for students to request accommodations, um, they have to provide us with documentation. Um, they meet with the disability counselor to discuss accommodations, and then the student submits accommodation requests to their instructors. Um, so a big difference between the college and the high school is that the student's really responsible for 
letting us know that they're there. There's no um, child find. Um, so we don't get a list from the high schools um, that students are graduating. They had IEPs or 504 plans. So the students very much responsible for seeking our services out, providing us with that information and then talking to us about what kind of things that they may need. Students also responsible for, for sending those accommodations to the instructors. So they kind of do their own case management. Um, they are um, responsible for letting us know if they're having any issues because we have um, a lot of students for very few counselors. So if we don't hear from them, we assume that everything is going well. So the student really does take a lot more of an active role um, in the college, college arena. And I'm gonna hand it over to Libby and she will continue on. Thanks, Beth. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elizabeth Jakubowski. I go by Libby Jakubowski, so you might see that name out there as well. Um, just as Beth said in the previous um, slide, uh, I'm going to go over some of the student responsibilities. When the students come to college, we will not know that that student may be requesting or need accommodations unless they connect with our office. So it really is the student's responsibility to self-disclose. Um, I have talked to students before um, when they were in a class and they sort of assumed, well, I had an IEP in college, so I thought I, or in high school, so I thought I had accommodations here um, with, the, with, the, with the idea that they automatically transferred. So we'll explain to the student, you know, you may have had an IEP in high school, but we won't know that in, unless you let us know. Um, so the way that they can do that, we have an online intake form that they can connect with their office. They can give us a call. They can send us an email. They can even stop by our office. We want it to be a welcoming and friendly way for them to connect with us. So they can just stop in and say, you know, I had an IEP in high school. I think I might need some of those accommodations in college as well. What's the best way to get started with that? And we'll help them with that process as well. It is the student's responsibility to ensure that the accommodations that, that they have, that they're eligible for and received are being met. So for example, once they have their academic accommodation form and, and they provide it to their faculty, if for whatever reason they, they are, the extra time for their test is not being implemented, they do need to let us know so that we can follow up with the faculty. And we also encourage the student to communicate with the faculty as well and take a proactive role um, in their accommodations. So rather than waiting for them not to be implemented, talking with their faculty, introducing themselves, reminding them that their accommodation forms were met and is there anything that they would like to discuss to ensure that their accommodations are in place. Um, so that all goes in terms of, you know, managing their academic progress independently as well. So, you know, as it is with the IEP, as it's different with the IEP, we are not knowing how the student is doing in each individual class. We do not have access to the instructor's um, grade book. We don't know how they're doing on each individual test, if, how their attendance is, unless the student comes and lets us know. Um, and so if they do feel like they're struggling in the class um, and they're not sure how to address that, we're always happy to help support them through troubleshooting that process. Um, but it is really up to the students to initiate that conversation. And then additionally, and, and, and along with managing their academic progress is seeking the available campus supports. There's a lot of campus supports that are available to all students, not just students with accommodations. We have learning assistance centers on every single campus with tutoring um, labs for English and math and subject specific tutoring. Um, each educational accessibility counselor is available to support the student along with academic advising and other resources. So those resources are there. It's up for the student to connect with them. And we're happy to help them through that process, but they have to let us know. All right, Libby, before we move on, we've got two questions. So the first oh. one is, um, can we use the last IEP as documentation? Uh, yeah, I mean, always, you can definitely bring that in and we will take a look at it. Um, ideally, we would like to see the documentation from the diagnosing professional. Um, but if you don't have that available and the IEP is comprehensive and includes information about the disability and what the diagnosis is and how it impacts in the learning process, we'll definitely um, read through that and use that in, in conversation, in addition to the conversation with the student to um, consider the accommodations for college. 
Right. And so, and I'm skipping over a question, but this one is kind of related. It says, how, how recent should the evaluation report be? So at TCC, we're pretty flexible as far as the dates on it. What I don't want you to do is go out and pay a fortune right now and to get a reevaluation. It would be a much better idea if you let us look at it um, and tell you, and we could tell you if we needed something else. Um, it's really depending on the type of accommodation the student needs. So while the documentation is important to receive services, we use that documentation to justify reasonable accommodation. So where are the weaknesses? Where does the disability impact the academic progress? And then that's how we come up with that and talking to the student with the, with the um, accommodations. So I wouldn't go out and spend, you know, $1,500 on a new psychoeducational until you list, let it look at it. We might be able to pull it. And a lot of the IEPs are written very, very well, and they have testing scores in there, and we can really get a lot of information. We just can't guarantee that every IEP we see. So it's very dependent before you spend money on doing something. Um, you can even email either one of us and just say, my, my child's planning on coming to your college next year. Can you just look at this and see if it will be enough? And I don't, we don't mind doing that at all. Um, and then the second question, uh, does the student need to be approved for accommodations prior to signing up for class? No. <laughs> one, one is uh, there, it's a separate process. Um, and we actually prefer that they, and sometimes you might see one before the other. Sometimes we meet with a student and, and establish their accommodations first and then help them um, with the registration process. And sometimes we don't see students until they've gone through the academic advising process already have their classes in place and then are coming to our office. So one does not need to be done before the other. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Oh, did I miss a question? Okay. Nope, that was good. Okay. Um, oh, well, I think one popped up. Okay, it says I work in records management department for uh, Chesapeake Public Schools. We request we get requests for IEPs for college bound former students. According to the Library of Virginia, we do not have to keep the IEPs. Why do colleges ask for them? when they expire. So the IEP, whether it expires or not, is not really our concern. What we use them is really for the information that we need from it. So we're not looking at an expiration date because we're not looking at the goals and objectives for the IEP, but what we are looking for is that in that present level of performance, what are their strengths and weaknesses, what kind of, we even look at some of the uh, accommodations they may have used in the past, and it's really just kind of a history gathering for us so that in conjunction with talking to the student, um, we can make decisions about accommodations. So it's not, it doesn't matter to us if it's expired or not, it, it's just what information can it give us with talking to the student and seeing what they've used in the past. I hope that makes sense. All right, go ahead. I think that's okay. everything, Libby. Um, so we went over the student responsibilities and now for the disability services responsibilities. So we will work with the student to establish that appropriate accommodations are provided based on the student's documented disability. So again, going back to that documentation, but also interview with the student, we will together come up with, in, in, uh, talking with the student, what accommodations do you need to have access to the learning experience at TCC? Um, we'll create an academic accommodation form from that experience and talk with the student and coach them through the process of providing that notification to their faculty. We'll facilitate the implementation of classroom accommodations. So when a student, when accommodations include things like interpreting or, um, alternative uh, technology or assistive technology, or um, uh, I'm trying to think of what the word, when we need to have enlarged materials or different types of materials, we will work directly with the faculty to ensure that the student has the materials that they need for that class. We talk a lot of, uh, with the students and encourage their self-advocacy. So we understand that coming from high school, to college is a completely different experience. You know, in one minute they're with their family and teachers and guidance counselors um, as part of a larger discussion for their IEP. And then all of a sudden there's this expectation that they go through the process independently. So we understand that it's a process and that they might need more support initially up front as they learn that independence. So we'll work with them through that process. Um, uh, we also provide faculty uh, support and training college-wide. So we have a number of different um, trainings for faculties throughout the semester. If faculty have questions about how to implement certain accommodations, they'll reach out to us and we'll, we'll work with them through that process. And we also provide assistance in resolving conflicts between students with disabilities and faculty members. So sometimes there might be some confusion or they need clarity on you know, how these accommodations will work in this classroom. Um, how can the student meet the requirements of their curriculum while having these accommodations in place? 
Sometimes we might have to make adjustments, but we always talk with both the student and the instructor um, to resolve some of those um, issues that might come up throughout the semester, um, especially if there's questions about how their accommodations pertain to that class. And then we definitely want to make sure that the parents have an understanding of how they can be involved as well, um, because I know it can be, you know, a little bit nerve wracking um, having the opportunity to be involved with your child's um, academic process through the high school setting and then suddenly, you know, finding that that's a little bit more limited when you get to the college, um, when you get to the college level. So we really encourage parents to talk with the students um, about the college expectations you know this is going to be a college experience now this is a little bit different from high school it's going to be expected that if you have a question that you talk with your faculty or if you have a concern about your academic progress you go meet with one of the academic advisors or your educational accessibility counselor so having that discussion about um you know what it's like to be a college student would be really important um we also think it's really helpful if you can um, support your student by providing a positive learning environment. And so one big change for students coming to college is suddenly they're spending way more time working on their schoolwork outside of class as opposed to getting most of their schoolwork done in school. Now the majority of the time that they're going to spend um, on homework and doing their in their studies is outside of the classroom. So they definitely need a learning environment that's conducive, that they have the opportunity to focus and study. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, we know that students have family responsibilities and, and sometimes they have a lot of things to do around the house and to help families as well. So it's just important to know that they're going to need to carve out a significant chunk of time to dedicate to their studies and helping them come up with that schedule um, could be really helpful. Encourage their independence. So you might be talking with them at home and realizing, okay, we need to figure something out here. Um, but rather than picking up the phone and calling on their behalf, we while you're sitting there with them, you could even say, let's call your educational accessibility counselor. Let's see if we can get you some help, but encourage them through the process of making the call and leaving a voice message or, um, you know, if, if they know that they need to follow up with a faculty member about a question that they have for class or say they have a question about the syllabus, we know that you'll probably help them compose that, that, that email that they need to send to them but maybe helping them through the process rather than um, doing it um, on their behalf can be really helpful in, in getting them comfortable with that process. And then being aware of the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. So um, when students do become a college student, whether or not they're 18 or not, um, we um, have to protect their privacy as a student. So the college is not permitted to um, provide access to students' educational records to family unless the student has provided permission through signing a FERPA form. Um, so you'll see more information about this once if, if your um, child uh, signs up you know, at TCC or another college or university, you'll start getting more information about that. And we can explain that to you as well um, when you touch base with our office. All right, we got some some two more questions. So are parents allowed or encouraged to attend? Um, so I can take that one. So it depends on the college, really. So at TCC, um, especially for those first appointments, um, I don't I don't think most of us typically mind if the parent is there. Um, sometimes <clears throat> you'll have a little bit more insight than the, the students can do. However, we really encourage you to let the student lead the conversation. Um, so we do direct questions to the student, like what is your major? What are your strengths and weaknesses? And you're kind of there almost as support, like if they forget something, just kind of poke them and say, did you, you know, don't forget that you have a hard time spelling or, or that sort of thing. Uh, my son's a freshman in college and I just went through this. So I feel like I have a better understanding of how hard it is um, to let them go. And I know I sat in the hallway when my son had his Zoom advising meeting and I had to bite my tongue the entire time. It was very hard for me, especially since I've been teaching these like parents really have to let their students go and, and actually doing it for the first time this year was difficult. So I can understand that. So um but you do want to check with the, the school that you go to. So um, TCC is a community college and we have open access and we remove a lot of barriers from students as far as documentation and that sort of the go, sort of thing. Um, certain schools may have different um, documentation standards. So it's always something good to check out and also with parent involvement. Um, so again, 
I don't think at TCC we mind. We don't want you to come to every meeting because the student really needs to get used to making their own appointments and coming to us um, by themselves and, and doing that. But the first one can be overwhelming and it is a long, it can be a long meeting and we ask a lot of questions and the process is just overwhelming. So there's no reason I don't think that you can definitely tag along, just making sure that the student knows that they need to control the conversation. Um, the next question, is this program just for TCC or any college um, the IEP student desires to attend? So that's kind of a harder question. So yes, every college and university that receives any kind of federal grant funding, which is basically every single college in the country, has to um, provide accommodations for students with disabilities. That's um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, as far as documentation concerns, um, there aren't any set standards. There are standards that we can go by, but they're not legally kind of binding. So it depends on each college. But I would say most of the ones, especially in Virginia, are pretty flexible with documentation standards, but they usually list them on their website. So it's really important when your child is applying for college, whether they go to TCC or if they're going to Texas A&M, to go on that website while you are doing applying. And just like you're looking at their sports programs and their majors, look at their disability service office. And so a really good, easy way to do that, because everybody calls their disability office something different. Um, is just to go on the search bar at the college and type in disability. And usually you can find that office um, and that way. And it's good to look at and you can call them and ask questions as well. Um, okay. I forgot that we have one more slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the timeline. <laughs> so a good thing to remember is the senior year, just begin gathering the documentation for your for your college and, and have it for yourself as well. Get copies um, for yourself. So get that last IEP that you had, look for any additional documentation that you um, had for evaluations or from your medical doctor or whatever it may be, um, and get copies of those ready, um, just so that you have as much information as possible to help with that process. After high school, um, after high school graduation, um, once you've applied to the college, you can submit the documentation directly to Disability Services. That was my timer. <laughs> um, 45 days approximately prior to the start of classes. So again, we're talking kind of specifically about TCC here. Um, and then after you um, have graduated, applied to TCC, submitted your documentation, um, we'll work with you to make an appointment to meet with us um, to go over the documentation to discuss accommodations. Right. And so we have another question, and this is kind of a you question because this is more advising than educational accessibility, but do we give the strong Campbell or interest survey like the Department of Labor and ONET? Um, our, our office specifically, no, we do not. Um, there may be um, availability to those resources through our career services or through some of the career advisors. Um, we're aware of those and oftentimes we'll use those in our discussion with students about other you know, interest inventories that you can find on ONED and, and how that can help um, guide that process of career exploration or major exploration with students that are really undecided. Um, and there's just one other thing I want to point out. So we do say we do ask students to submit and get everything with accommodation straight 45 days to, before classes start or 30 days. Um, and I think a question earlier asked about do you have to start the classes with accommodation? So you can actually get accommodations at the end of the semester, if that's what it is, is whenever you bring the documentation. So it's not once classes start, you're cut off from, from bringing in anything to us. But what is important to know is that accommodations are not retroactive. So if you bring us documentation on October 30th and you failed your midterm before you came in, you can receive accommodations from October 30th on, but it's not going to do anything to help you with that, which you've already failed. You can't go back and retake assignments with accommodations. They start the day that their instructors receive them. So you, we, and we have this with students a lot who decide that they don't need accommodations anymore. They don't think they needed them. Maybe they were monitoring consult in the high schools and so they were barely using their accommodations they decide not to register with us they get to the midterms and they're not doing well in their classes they bring in documentation we can't do anything about the first half of the semester the only thing we can do is provide accommodations for them for the rest of the semester so while you can come in the last week of classes and if you can get in and get with us, because we're usually busy then, um, and get an appointment, you can get accommodations then, um, but they're just not going to help you for, for past, um, past issues with grades. 
Okay, so here's our contact information, and, and we understand that this is a lot of information, and you have, may have more specific questions or want to have more of a discussion later. Um, so please feel free to give us a call or send us an email, and we're happy to talk to you about more specific questions at another time. And we look forward to, if your son or daughter um, plans to come to TCC, we, we look forward to meeting you. And I believe, okay, sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. At this time, I'll go, I will turn the program over to Dr. Beverly Boone Harris from Norfolk State University. Welcome. Good evening. I am Beverly Boone Harris, Director of OASIS, Office of Accessibility accessibility services and international students and an assistive technology laboratory. OASIS is two distinct areas serving accessibility students and international students. As, that's fine. Accessibility service, the Office of Accessibility Services is committed to promoting equal access to the university's programs, services and activities for students with documented disabilities. Students who have a disability are encouraged to contact OASIS and request an application for services. Students requesting accessibility services are required to self-identify. Next. The initial registration process is, three, is a three-step process. Step one, complete accessibility services application. We recommend the students who have been accepted to the university complete the OASIS application at least 45 days prior to classes beginning. Step two, provide documentation. Students must provide documentation of their disability. Documentation must describe the nature of the impairment and protect impact on the student's ability to participate in the university educational programs and services. Medical documentation may, may be a signed letter from a physician, psychologist, rehabilitation counselor, 504 plan, or IEP. Pay step three, complete intake interview. Once the completed application and proper documentation is received, OASIS will review these materials to determine eligibility for services and support. A virtual intake meeting or phone conference will be scheduled to further discuss accessibility services process and guidelines. This was done during COVID. And so we're back full-time in school. So your interview will, will nine times out of 10 will be in person. No uh, accommodations are made on a case-by-case -case basis and are not retroactive. Students are required to re-register for, for their classes each semester. That's saying each time, each semester, once you've been accepted into the program, Disability Services, we ask that each semester you come to the office, bring us your class schedule. So we we'll know that you, one, in, the, in school, Second, we know who your professors are. So if there is a flare up in your disability, we have access to contact your professors to let them know that you, you will be in contact with them as soon as you are able. That means some students get hospitalized, some students just don't feel well when their uh, disability flare up, but they contact our office and they, we send our emails to the professors for that semester to let them know that um, you are having some issues. Accessibility service providers, a wide range of services and accommodations. And these are our services, faculty notification letters, educators for success, support group. This support group is for our students. We meet twice a month, so once in the morning, once in the evening. We try to vary the time and the days so that we can be a part of everybody's schedule. This is to introduce you to internships, um, summer um, programs, scholarships, and any number of things, but it also gives you opportunity to ask us any questions you may be having with your professors, your experiences that we can uh, help you with. Provide low distracting testing sites, 
shuttle, bus services, vocational rehabilitation, referral assistance, accommodations, note taking, record le recorded lectures, interpreters, housing, dining accommodations, service, emotional support animals, testing accommodations, extended time, scribe, and or AT lab. We have a program called Counselors in Residence. These are our senior social science majors, sociology, psychology, uh, rehab. And it is at, with these students, we use them as our hand and our feet to assist students with note taking in the classroom, prepare, help them to prepare for scheduling homework assignments, writing term papers, any number of things, along with the other services that are across campus as it pertains to persons assisting students with tutoring and writing. But we do this within our office. Next. Frequently asked questions, I won't go through all of them. Um, is my disability information shared with my professors? No. Accessibility maintains and secures all files. The information in your file is not shared with anyone who is not affiliated with our office unless you request this and sign a release of information form. Our office may provide advocacy for students but your personal information is not shared with faculty. They simply get a letter saying that this student is properly registered in our office and we, it's a little paragraph, and then we list the accommodations we are asking them to assist us with. If I am receiving accommodations to another college, at another college or university, will I automatically receive accommodations at Norfolk State University? No, you must self-identify to accessibility service, provide documentation, and have completed the process to become registered before accommodations can be provided at Norfolk State University. Do I need to do anything to get accommodations again next semester? If you are satisfied with your academic adju adjustments, which were originally agreed upon, all you will need to do is provide your class schedule and request your accommodation letter at the start of each new semester to give to your instructors. And the students actually come in, pick up their five, six letters. We have a, a signature sheet. As you give your professor your um, letter, introduce yourself, he or she will sign off on a signature sheet. We also have a line for our assisted technology lab. We ask you to go there provide the letter to our coordinator, and he will give you an orientation of the, the software that's there, whatever may, may help assist you with your disability. Once you have all of those signatures, we ask that you bring it back to our office. It goes in your file. And so if a professor on a given situation refuses to assist you with accommodations, we go to that file, we look in and say, Dr. So-and-so, you signed and said you would help us provide these services. And it works pretty good. Um, and so when we do that, then the process moves forward. Is tutoring provided specifically for students with disabilities? No, but there are tutoring resources available at Norfolk State. All are free of charge. Online tutoring is also available and tutors are available through individual academic departments. And across the board, we have various types of services within the departments and across the board to assist students in their success. Next, please. Our assistive technology lab is designed to level the playing field for accessibility students. The AT lab has specialized software to aid in the provision of accommodations. All students, faculty and staff can utilize the AT lab, but the lab is designed for accessibility students. But we do have faculty and staff with various types of disability that benefit from using our lab. The lab is located in the library in 1023. The lab is quiet and conducive for learning. The hours are eight to five, Monday to Fridays, and there's always adjustment made if a student needs to come in earlier or stay later. So we advocate and work with our students on their own personal needs. Next slide. 
the available software within our lab. And like I said, the students take their letters, a letter to Mr. to our coordinator in the library. At that point, he gives you an orientation on the software that may be best for your disability or whatever your needs are. And these, these softwares are uh, text to speak, read and write, go. I'll give you a few se seconds to look at it. But these are what we offer. And some has been have been updated. The services at a AT lab orientation, that's what I just talked about, assistance with utilization of AT lab software, printing up to 15 pages daily, document scanning, work study student guidance, assistance in AT lab for students. Next slide. Uh, slide. That's basically it. I'm Beverly Boone Harris. We have an administrative assistant the coordinator of accessibility services and Mr. Murphy, our assistive technology lab. We're located in the James A. Bowser building, suite 121, AT lab co located in the Brooks Library, 1023. Uh, any question? Oh, nope, I didn't go. It looks like we don't have any questions, but I do have one question. How soon, and either one of you can answer this question, how soon should parents be looking at um, enrolling their child in, you know, getting their, their paperwork and all of that together? How soon should they be doing this? Should, you know, January is coming up. If they're interested in re registering for the fall semester, should they be putting these things in place now? Um, could they wait to the summer? What do you well, recommend? They can come and visit us anytime and we will give them a tour. However, we do not accept students in the program until they have been accepted to the university. At the point they receive their acceptance letter to the university, we can go full force. And like I said, at least 45 days prior to classes beginning. Right, so we, we do want students to have an, a student ID. So while Norfolk State's a four-year university and they do send out acceptance letters, you have to at least do the application and get a student ID. Without that student ID, we'll have no idea how to store and track the information because we don't have anything to connect it to. So once the application for TCC is complete, like if they're a dual enrollment student and they already have a student ID, hopefully they're talking to us anyway because we can provide accommodations for them for their dual enrolled classes. Um, but yes, that would be when. It's a little early now, but I mean, what, usually April is really early, but it's great to get started, but you can do it all the way up until classes start. But we're very busy in August, so it's really hard to get in to see us. Great. Okay. Thank you very much ladies um miss so did you want to say anything before we conclude our webinar uh, yes i just wanted to say to miss harris i know our tcc uh counselors elizabeth and beth both mentioned that in regard to documentation that there's no cap on the psychological testing date and i don't know if you mentioned that or had that in any of your slides at norfolk state university in regard to documentation, how recent does that psychological testing have to be? At least three years. It, okay. would, it can't be more than three years old. And what we have done, uh, when, when I started the program, uh, I met with OCR about some of the issues that we have. And so we do accept IEPs in college. We don't advertise it. We don't... Um, we just don't, but if a student comes because of the population of students, they can always afford a full battery of tests that could run you in it in a number of high or low. At any rate, we will accept the IEP, look at the document, and typically they evaluate students in high school that senior year, some time during the senior year. If the student doesn't come directly to college, then we will accept that IEP up until two years out. And then uh, they won't have to deal with having other um, documentation. If we find that what they have there and there, there has to be another type of document, then we, you may have to be evaluated by someone. And I'm sure you look at things, uh, like you said, on a case by case basis. Case by case basis. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
All righty. I think this was um, all the questions that we have. We did receive one um, thank you from one of our uh, members. She said this information was very helpful. Um, and so we hope that this was helpful for a lot of you um, and you gained a lot of um, beneficial information. Um, at this time, I would like to thank Mrs. Regina Stowe, Transition Specialist for Chesapeake Public Schools, as well as Beth Callahan and Libby Jakubowski. I hope I said that right from Tidewater Community College and Dr. Beverly Boone Harris from Norfolk State University for your wealth of knowledge and expertise. I hope that each of you gained information that will help you and your family. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive a link for feedback. Please take a moment to complete this as we will draw raffle prizes um, after you enter your feedback. Um, if you would like to contact the Office of Family and Community Engagement, please email us at face, that's F-A-C-E, at cpschools.com and like us on Twitter at CPS Face. Remember, families and communities work better together. Thank you and have a wonderful night.